Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a captivating conversation about democratic engagement or disengagement uh, in the aftermath of Canada's 44th federal election. I'm Pam Sugman, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University. A university, as I'm sure you've heard, is soon to be known by another name, um, a long overdue change. I am delighted to welcome you to the 19th, this 19th Democracy Forum. And I'd like to extend an especially warm welcome to those of you who are joining us as part of Ryerson's Alumni Week. Special thanks also goes to the Toronto Star for supporting this event as a media partner. I wish to acknowledge the land on which Ryerson University is situated. Ryerson is on the territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. It is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, Treaty 13, and the Williams Treaties. Like many others in the Ryerson community, I continue to reflect on the meaning of land acknowledgements particularly in light of our reckoning with our own university's history of colonization, a history that extends, uh, exists not only in the past, but very much shapes the present day. As an academic leader and more personally as a Japanese Canadian woman whose family was interned in this country, I am very committed to deepening my understanding of indigenous knowledge and philosophy. I'm deeply committed to promoting Indigenous education, and most importantly, I am committed to supporting the pursuit of Indigenous self-determination. Now, as our regular attendees know, the Democracy Forum brings together speakers from various sectors in society to address current social issues from a range of political perspectives. In today's event, our panel of experts will address questions about what did and didn't work effectively in this election, the central issues that shaped the campaigns, how Indigenous issues were presented and addressed, and the rise of the far-right fringe. I'm now pleased to introduce our host and founder of the Democracy Forum series, Toronto Star columnist and visiting practitioner in the Faculty of Arts here at uh, Ryerson University, Martin Reg Kahn. Most of you are no doubt familiar with Martin's work, including his political column uh, for the Toronto Star, in addition to the work he produced during his 11 years as a foreign correspondent, years during which he held the positions of Chief of the Middle East and Chief of the Asian, Asia Bureaus. Martin is also a senior fellow at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Martin, I'll now ask you to step onto this virtual stage. Thanks, Dr. Sogeman, and welcome to our 19th Democracy Forum, where we try to get everyone engaged at election time. And we also try to keep voters involved in between elections. If you're watching us on the CPAC television network, thanks for joining us. If you are part of the alumni group involved in this week's activities, it's good to see you stick with us. And if you heard about us through the Toronto Star, uh, special thanks to Canada's biggest and best newspaper uh, for being our media partner. Today, just over a week after Election Day, our theme of democratic engagement is feeling a little stressed. Uh, voter turnout went down, not up, in Canada's 44th election. So what happened and what happens next? We have a panel of four distinguished scholars to deconstruct the result and look ahead to accountability, accountability from our politicians and from our democratic institutions so that we can get action on climate change, on, on coping with, uh, with COVID uh, and, and surviving the economic disruption and dealing with, with uh, um, uh, Indigenous reconciliation. So here's our panel, starting with three professors from the Faculty of Arts. We have Dr. Pamela Palmiter, who is Chair of Indigenous, Govern uh, Indigenous Governance. She is a Mi'kmaq lawyer uh, from the uh, Eel River Bar First Nation in New Brunswick, published author. She has four university degrees because one is never enough, uh, as my professor used to tell me at university. Um, she has a master's and doctorate in law from Dalhousie. Her academic work focuses on Indigenous law and sovereignty. She was active in the Idle No More movement. And outside the classroom, you may see a lot of her television commentary. She's in high demand, so we are grateful she could join us today, especially because she's juggling an evening class. So she's really on the job. 
Dr. Tracy Rainey is professor and director of the Master in Public Policy and Administration program. Her doctorate is from U of Calgary and among her specialties is gender-based violence in politics. Here on campus, she co-founded the Women in the House program that fosters political leadership for students. In fact, Tracy and I teamed up to bring together a couple of uh, women ex-premiers for the Ryerson Democracy Forum, uh, Kathleen Wynne and Rachel Notley. And I suppose Rachel Notley might be a future premier, so we shouldn't count her out. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Ruparelio holds the Jaroslavsky Democracy Chair. He studied at McGill and Cambridge. He taught at Columbia University and the New School in New York before coming to the Faculty of Arts. He has served as a consultant to the UN and his current focus is citizen engagement and digital technologies in Canada and around the world. And he also hosts a public lecture series on the front lines of democracy. And finally, Dr. Lori Turnbull is director of the School of Public Administration and associate professor at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And she not only teaches political science at Dal uh, and before that at Queens, she also practiced the art of politics, the dark art of politics or public policy, let's say, when she was seconded to Ottawa in the Privy Council Office, Ministry of Democratic Institutions as well. Her academic specialties are parliamentary governance and democratic reform. And she is also a frequent media commentator in the Toronto Star, the Globe, Global TV, she's everywhere. So it's a great panel. I have to disclose my own bias first, full disclosure, because I studied at Dalhousie, and so I am feeling a special secret bond with uh, Lori and Pamela for their connections to Dal, but uh, more seriously, a warm welcome to all four of you. So I'm going to kick off the questions, uh, but it's a good time to start thinking up your own. If you want to question our guests, you can send them via the chat function on Zoom, and Ryerson's Melissa Wong uh, is waiting to hear from you. If you give us your name, uh, I can give you a shout out and I'll read out the questions. So here we go. All right, so this is a democracy forum. So let us do a quick checkup on how democracy worked or didn't work in this election. The biggest issue you could say was the election itself. Uh, we heard a lot about wasting $600 million on an early and unnecessary vote two years ahead of schedule. But just to get things going here, I am going to be, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'll be a sacrificial lamb. You can all beat me up. I'm going to push back against that idea that early elections can ever be uh, a waste or get in the way of democracy. I love democracy. To me, a vote is precious. It's a chance for people to have their say. So are we experts, the media, the academics making a mistake by piling on and repeating this idea that elections are too expensive? Because this one costs $600 million. The federal budget is about $600 billion. So you do the math, that's about one-tenth of 1% 1 that it costs. That's a decimal point for democracy. So Pamela, do you want to start beating me up? And uh, we'll go around the table, but, but also more seriously, let's acknowledge that Indigenous voters were shortchanged on a number of reserves where there weren't polling stations as were a lot of university students because there was no campus voting stations. But Pamela, go ahead. Okay, Martin, first round, here's the deal. Uh, generally, obviously in a democracy like Canada's, elections are important. I don't think you could ever have a rule that says you can never have them early or you shouldn't have them early. I, I think there's a situation for everything. But in the middle of a pandemic, when we're telling people, you know, social distance and, you know, not even all the kids are going to schools and think about schools and the need to use schools for things like polling stations. Um, and and the, just the kind of chaos that it creates, A, in a pandemic, B, in such a, a accelerated time frame and a, so much uncertainty. I mean, all around us, you have anti-masker protests and, you know, far right protests and people weren't really sure about what was happening and just drive by some of the polling stations and some of them waited for hours. And I don't know that that, that, that was really the best choice. I, I don't know that it's undemocratic to say that we should have waited, but I think in a pandemic, given all of the money that is being spent, given all of the safety and security issues that people have around the pandemic, it was a pretty big gamble to get the same thing. And I think most people pretty much expected we'd end up right where we were. Okay, Tracy, were we, were we rolling the dice recklessly here? Well, um, 
Martin, I'm actually going to agree with you, I think, oh. uh, on this point. Um, Bless you. In a, West, in a Westminster style parlor, parliamentary system, a prime minister um, you know, has every right to, uh, to seek a mandate from the electorate, um, you know, especially if he feels that he no longer has the confidence of the House. Uh, where I disagree, I think, with Trudeau is the justification that he provided uh, for the election call, which was to suggest that Parliament um, was toxic and dysfunctional. And I think that sort of does a, a disservice, I think, to the role that opposition parties play in Parliament um, and the role um, that, uh, that's needed and necessary for them to hold the government to account through, through responsible government. So what I wish he had done is instead Go to the electorate and say we are in the middle of a pandemic. I don't feel like I have the confidence in the house, and so we need to we need to get a mandate rather than sort of blame it on the the toxicity of Parliament itself. Thanks for not beating me up. It's, if you were, it's, we had Trudeau on our Democracy Forum back in June, and it was interesting to hear him talk, try to talk up, if I can put it that way, the toxicity that he saw in Parliament, kind of setting the stage for an election call that that didn't really sell. Um, Lori, can, let's turn to you uh, on, on the same theme, but let's just draw this out a little bit. I mean, voter turnout wasn't great, but it wasn't as bad as some of us thought it was. The early number was it was below 60%, which would have been the second worst in our history. Turns out now when you add in the mail-in votes, it's at about 62%, which is about average, but way below where it was in the last two elections, 67, 68%, which by the way, can be attributed perhaps to Trudeau generating some excitement and people wanting to push out Stephen Harper. Um, so your view, was this Trudeau's, did Trudeau jump the gun? Does Elections Canada get some of the blame for this, for, for, for canceling the idea of these campus voting stations a year ago, long before there was talk of an election? Where, where do you land on this? So like, I don't think that there was any question at all that the prime minister had the confidence of the house. That was clear. And it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, Jagmeet Singh, whether he really liked what the prime minister was doing or not, was was in for the long haul. And I think that if the par if Parliament had met again in September with no election, we might have seen you know kind of some interesting dynamics between those two parties. And think and in the sense that I think they are kind of playing for the same space a lot of the time. Would Singh have kind of flexed his muscles a bit more, got a little more out of the prime minister? Like I think there was tons of runway left for this Parliament. It was probably the most stable minority Parliament we've ever seen, toxic or not. And so I don't think that the prime minister's bid for the need for an election ever really panned out. And the fact that there was a pandemic on top of it made it worse. It was like, not only are you absolutely explicitly going for a majority because you think you can get it, you're doing it at a time where people have a reason to think that this might not be safe for them. And so I just think the bid never, that it just never paid off for them. It never made sense. You're right. And, and uh, another plug for our democracy forum, we had Jagmeet Singh on as well. And he made it very clear when I asked him that he was going to support Trudeau on those issues and was not going to side with the Conservatives. So good point. Um, Sanjay, give us some context here. Is this is this an outrage by international standards or or did you see any justification for this? Well, internationally, since the pandemic began, we've seen uh, Two, two thirds of elections that have been held have actually seen a, a lower turnout. Now we have to sort of disaggregate that because it depends how early in the pandemic uh, elections occurred. But I think I'd have to agree with, uh, you know, some of the comments already made by, by Laurie and Pamela and also Tracy, uh, same. I think we all kind of agree that, you know, was this the best circumstances to have a, an election? I think the crucial thing that comes away from it is that if you're gonna call an election, and everyone thinks it's to gain a majority, you're gonna breed cynicism. And the fact that, you know, even the Angus Reid poll said halfway through the campaign, people felt it was unnecessary, that was quite a telling sign. I think the other thing is that if you're gonna call an election, uh, like the prime minister did, you don't have the shortest possible campaign possible. So you ask, you know, is Election Canada on the hook for this? I think the Trudeau government's on the hook for this because they couldn't get enough polling stations, polling booths set up. Voter cards came out quite late. Mine showed up three days before the election. Uh, including the pamphlets, you know, uh, the, the various manifesto cards. So I think it really does rest on um, the government, and I think they're lucky they didn't get away with the worst with the worst outcome. And you know, a vote is a terrible thing to waste. And my own daughter on campus uh, didn't get her vote in time, so she lost out, and that and so that was a, that was a killer for me. Okay, look, the timing was bad. Um, but there were some big issues to decide on it. And, and, and granted that, it, that, that COVID colored all this. And, and can I just say in my own defense that it was hard for me to take the Tories and the New Democrats complaining about this when Stephen Harper 
called early elections in his day, and John Horgan in New Democratic Party, Premier of British Columbia, called one early in mid-pandemic as well. But setting that aside, politicians aren't allowed to cheat. We're allowed to tell the truth, as it were. Um, so you had all these big issues to talk about, but was there, and to decide on, but was there a decisive issue? By that, I mean, was there a ballot question, which is what politicians and political operators and political scientists always talk about? The ballot question is what's on voters' mind when they are casting their ballot? What's the overarching issue? Did we have a ballot question? And, and if so, my question to you is, what was it? Anyone? Who's first? Oh, I'm not seeing an answer to that one. Come on, who's who's got a who think? Okay, Laura, you were kind of making a move. Who 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 thinks that there was a a ballot question that that preoccupied people most of all? Um, I, I don't think there was a clear one for everybody. I think that the that's kind of the prime minister's job, actually. If there if he's going to call an early election to tell us why we're here, whereas it's not the same pressure if you're having an on cycle election. I think halfway through the campaign, he tried to make the the ballot question about his own and his government's handling of COVID nineteen. And he, you kind of leveraged this protest movement against him to say, you know, you want to be with the anti-vaxxers or you want to be with me. And I don't know if that ever really kind of take, took off as a ballot question, but I think that was the point where the, the things kind of shifted in a way that, again, like some others have said, like this could have gone worse for him. So I think that was the point where it, it, it started to kind of add up for him again. And there's kind of an internal contradiction if you say halfway when he was a bit desperate for a, for a ballot question to say, these guys are scary, but I triggered this election or rolling the dice as the NDP would say. So that it didn't really add up. Anyone else have a ballot question or same, same answer? There wasn't one. I, th I think, sorry, go ahead, Tracy. I actually think Pamela had her hand up, um, but maybe I can just jump in there. I, I, I completely agree with Lori. Um, I think it right out of the gate, Trudeau was attempting to frame the campaign to be about who do you want to best manage the pandemic moving forward? Um, and I think he got sort of knocked off that message a little bit. Um, and I think that that the answer to that actually, what, what the electorate ended up um, sort of uh, returning is, is a mixed response to that. Right, which is which is that you know some people thought that it would be Trudeau, some people thought that it would be O'Toole, uh, some people thought that it would be Singh, etc. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think out of the gate, it, it was sort of framed as being about uh, pandemic management, but but ended up being um, sort of a, a mixed sort of uh, return on that. Pam and then Sanjay. Yeah, uh, clearly what um, Laurie and Tracy both said, I think that's what he wanted this to be about COVID because he kept saying, I want Canadians to make their choice. But ultimately, other issues took over and I don't know that they directed it to be that way. But if you look at the issue around childcare, because if you look at jobs, they're all promising a million jobs. You know, they, they canceled themselves out on, on several issues. There wasn't like a huge diversity of opinion but on child care it was radically different between liberals and ndp and conservatives it, and it ended up being you either want child care at ten dollars a day or a tool's going to obliterate it i mean that's the kind of you know polarizing issue that came up i think what's missing and i know we'll talk about it later is that they missed the opportunity with all when all these surveys were saying that one of the issues that the majority of canadians care about most are indigenous issues and reconciliation and that wasn't their and none of them used that opportunity to highlight their platforms. I mean, O'Toole didn't have a real good platform, but I mean, the NDP and Liberals could have been pounding on that, and they didn't. Yeah. Sanjay. Yeah, I was just struck at the beginning. It seemed like a bit of a fishing expedition. You know, what is the ballot question? Uh, and in an odd way, I was just listening to, you know, uh, what everyone's saying. In an odd way, you might argue, I think that what Trudeau tried to frame the election about kind of came home in the last week, but that wasn't because of him. That had to do with O'Toole not really being able to handle his party. I mean, the contrast between the two parties is very striking. Like the Liberal Party to a fault is tight as a ship, and if you dissent, there's no room for you. And we know that from 2019 and up to 2021. I think with the Conservatives, it was that that seemed to be a lot of the press after some time is. You know, who is O'Toole? He, he ran to the center in this election. He ran to the right in order to become the leader. Uh, people were upset in the party, a certain wings of it. And then of course, the gift for the Trudeau government is what happened. I mean, this tragedy that's unfolding in Alberta, which was entirely predicted when it happened in June. I mean, it was the most reckless, irresponsible set of decisions that they took um, to open things up. 
and and timing matters crucially in campaigns and in politics. And you know, if that had happened two weeks later, um, it might have swayed uh, you know some voters. There were a lot. There were about twenty ridings that were less than two thousand votes each uh, between liberals and conservatives, and suddenly things could have swung in a slightly different way. So I think in a funny way, he got the answer he wanted. That's the crazy paradox. I mean, all of your answers seem to be that there really wasn't a, a ballot question. So we had this election about nothing, which turned into a controversy about having the election. And yet, as Pam points out, there really were differences between the parties, and, and particular childcare being the, the most obvious, Indigenous reconciliation, the Indigenous issues, which we'll come to in a minute, also di significant differences and, and on climate change on the same wavelength roughly, but serious differences in approach. And, and so, and yet, but why have the election if it was already gonna be taken care of in parliament? So let's, let's talk about, uh, just before we get to indigenous issues, I wanna just turn first to climate change just because it happened uh, yesterday. So this is a fresh uh, finale to an issue that dogged the campaign, which is on the one hand, the, the, the pre, the, the, the preeminent importance of climate change. On the other hand, the implosion of the Green Party, whose mandate was to save the planet, save the world. So it was front and center in the campaign, but the Green Party was sidelined. And Annamie Paul, the first Black Jewish woman to lead a federal party, also appeared on, on this forum a few months ago. Um, we had her as our guest. She was great. We watched her in action and the debate. Great performance. And now she's out of action, taken out of action by her own party, uh, resigned, no surprise. So if, let me just try to set this up as, as a, a microcosm or an intersection between uh, an issue and identity and, and, and a disconnect between domestic politics, foreign affairs, because the Green Party exploded over Gaza and Israel uh, at war a few months ago. And and so and and Anami Paul said it was also about racism, sexism, misogyny, and also anti-Semitism, uh, perhaps all of the above. Tracy, why don't you start with this? Um, she talked about smashing the glass ceiling, and she talked about very vividly both on the debate stage and again yesterday about the shards of glass that bloodied her. I was breaking a glass ceiling. I was going to fall on my head and leave a lot of shards of glass that I was going to have to crawl through. Wow. What happened? Yeah, I, I I don't think I've ever seen a resignation speech uh, like the one Paul gave uh, yesterday in my time of, of watching politics. And I, I often sort of think about these sort of um, historical events in terms of what first year Canadian politics textbooks are going to write and what they're going to say um, about uh, about these sort of events. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, she's the first black Jewish woman um, to lead a major party in Canada educated at Princeton, uh, a lawyer. Um, she founded a nonprofit uh, on political leadership. So I think the history books will, will say that, but I think they will also say um, that she hadn't been leader of her party for more than a year when the attacks against her leadership began within her own political party itself, right? And this is, you know, this is a familiar story to, to women, to black women, to women of color, where we see women um, take on these leadership roles and it's much more precarious. And they seem to be also judged by the same standard that we apply um, to other leaders, a, a white male standard. And I wanna just say just uh, very quickly, I, I know, is that I think she actually ran um, a, a pretty good campaign. Uh, and I don't think that we should um, consider her resignation as something that was a voluntary act. She did choose the timing of it to a certain extent, but it was a situation where her own party, I think, made it just impossible for her to con continue on and that she was essentially uh, pushed out. And I think as well as that, um, we need to also be thinking about this as not just an issue that's internal to the Green Party itself. This is a problem with white male dominance within the Canadian um, uh, political system as a whole. And there's a pattern here, right? Like we've heard other Indigenous women, women of color, um, uh, Cesar Chavanez, Kakak, Wilson Rabel, talk about their experiences of what they face in the campaign trail and within political institutions. And so I think Paul's experience really um, sort of tells us how exclusionary Canadian politics still is and how far we have to go to make politics uh, more inclusive overall. Okay. Uh, Laurie, can I turn to you on the same issue? It wasn't just regicide against the enemy. Paul, it was kind of a political suicide for an entire political movement, the Green Party. They imploded 
They ended up with just 2.3 of the per percent of the vote, 2.3, less than half of what they got last time, probably a, a, about a, a less than half of what the uh, People's Party of Canada got. Um, she also flamed out in her own riding. Let's face it, she came in fourth behind the Tories, which was a which was a surprise because that's where she focused all of her energies. Um, the idea of the Green Party sounded great to a lot of green people um, a decade ago, and you know now the, the the ground has shifted a little bit. Everyone's talking about climate change. Even the Tories accept carbon pricing, even if it's a ridiculously low price, not a real price. So, is the Green Party? still a good idea or do you pine for the days i don't want to frame this as nostalgia but do you do you think there's a a better place for big tent parties that bring people together instead of the risk of uh, splitting the vote whether it's the green party or the or the ppc okay so you snuck like seven questions in there so i'm <laughs> going to try to i'm going to try to hack away at that um, so I think like for the Green Party, even you can use different indicators to see what happened here and how it happened and you can ma map out the chronology over time and it's a short runway for enemy Paul in terms of the amount of time that transpired between when oh, she yeah. went, won the leadership and now it's over. Um, even if you use the indicator, her first results, actually I guess it was her second result when she ran, ran in Toronto Centre last year and coming quite, you know, did really well and then this time came fourth. And so, like, clearly, this was the Green Party was not offering a plausible scenario to voters because they couldn't keep their own house in order because the party wasn't behind her. And in politics like that's we, we are in a Westminster parliamentary system. It's about confidence. If the party doesn't have confidence in you, where are you going to get your legitimacy from? And for her not having a seat, I think it was impossible for her to try to anchor her leadership in something right because without a seat, without some constituency in the party that were saying, hey, we voted for her and she's the leader and we want her here. You didn't hear that. And so it was just like she 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 didn't have any anything to kind of press herself against to say, no, I'm, I'm the leader and I'm going to keep going here. As far as uh, the Green Party, though, I mean, somewhat miraculously, they still managed to elect somebody in Kitchener Center. Obviously, that ballot was blown open for, for another reason, but like he, they have elected someone, which gives them. Yeah, let's some... just quickly quickly explain. My, my, I'm going to play moderator or host yeah. here and just say that. And the, the reason that the fluke you're referring to is that a liberal had to bow out because of allegations of of sexual impropriety. So that cleared the way for the Greens to get that seat. A bit of a one off. But back to you, Lori. But still, uh, in 2019, he had won 25 percent of the popular vote. It wasn't a, a complete, you know, come from nowhere kind of victory. Like this guy had done the work in the writing. And so maybe that's one place to start for the Greens is when you're a, when you're a fifth place party, your brand is not going to carry you. You have to be the candidate in the writing, doing the work and giving someone something to vote for other than a strategic reason. Now that is hard. And so like building for the Greens where they go from here, that's that's a really hard you know up uphill battle. But as you say, like you know all the parties have to be green. Um, I don't know whether the Conservatives really buy carbon pricing or not. Yeah, Aaron O'Toole put it in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, how, how deep is that commitment? Like, I, I, it was, I don't it know. It was a pretend carbon price because it was so low, but, but yeah. yeah, fair point. But he's he was trying to cover it off, right? Like he wasn't, he was he was trying to create a strategy that would appeal broadly enough and in a tank, it didn't work. But I mean, for right now, um, for the Greens to, to build, I think, you know, first and foremost, they have to get the leadership question right. And that's going to be hard for them. Like, and, and that goes back to this really being a party that's centered around Elizabeth May, her identity, her brand, and not having the party infrastructure to be able to do a transition smoothly. It's hard enough for the big parties to change leaders, but when the small parties try to do it, it, it can be completely devastating from yeah. an existential perspective. Yeah. Sanjay or, or Pam, any, any, any uh, comments to add? Yeah, I think we also have to look at what happened to the Green Party. Uh, what was leading up even before the election was called for the entire time she didn't have anyone in her shadow cabinet on indigenous issues you can't have a green party without your significant 50 other percent i mean literally the green party and indigenous issues and climate action and land defenders i mean those two things went hand in hand for many, many years. You can't just all of a sudden not embrace those relationships. And Indigenous peoples kept saying, where is your shadow cabinet person? Where, no response. She didn't respond to Indigenous people. She didn't talk about Indigenous issues. It was always just like, Indigenous people should speak for themselves. Okay, great, but that's not an answer on what your party's doing on Indigenous issues tied to climate change. So 
even before the election was called, I don't think she was in a good position and she certainly didn't have uh, the widespread report. And, and, you know, I differ from what some people think about the debates. She seemed uninterested, dispassionate. She wasn't promoting her green agenda, the indigenous environmental agenda. I mean, she just had flip responses, uh, always centered it on herself or said things like indigenous people should speak for themselves. Uh, again, okay, but you're running to be the leader of uh, you know this, this country, you've got to say more than that. So I'm not at all surprised. In addition to all of the internal issues that that happened, well, lot, lots to unpack there. And and I, I I think that was an interesting observation about the debate. A lot of people liked her. A lot of people thought they were that they were sort of facile, cheap shots about feminism and 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 indigenous uh, preeminence in issues. Something she often talked about. So let's 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 segue to indigenous issues. And Pam, uh, you, you, uh, you're gonna lead the way here because you have done all the heavy lifting on the research. Uh, you have done a you know, deep dive comparing the party platforms and where they're different, where, where the gaps are and, and, and where they're similar. And also in terms of how they actually convey them and, and to what extent they stand behind them in an election. And now that the liberals are elected going forward. So that's, a, that's also seven questions packed into one, I apologize but your analysis. Well, headed into the election, you know, despite all of the problems around Trudeau and his, you know, partially completed promises and other things that he had done, he is still markedly different than the Conservative Party. I mean, mm -hmm. Indigenous peoples, for the first time in history, some who had never voted their entire lives came out to vote to vote out Harper's Conservatives because they were so adversarial, so anti-Indigenous rights, anti-human rights. So Trudeau comes in, makes a whole bunch of promises, doesn't keep them all uh, pretty significant. Then when he's elected again into minority, you have the NDP constantly pushing him on Indigenous issues. And so you did see some action. Now, in terms of the platforms, you saw Liberals and NDP almost identical. I mean, the NDP, you could say, was a Liberal plus kind of uh, agenda. But on every core issue, they were essentially saying the same things like, you know, we've the, the UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples had been implemented, we're going to respect Indigenous rights, we're going to increase, you know, uh, bolster human rights at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, we're going to do clean water, more money for housing, address murder to missing, we're going to address kids in foster care, all the same stuff in the NDP, except the NDP would go further and say, you know, we're going to center all of this on Indigenous sovereignty and center Indigenous women as leaders in self-determination. Some of those things, again, get rid of sex discrimination in the Indian Act, stuff that we've been asking for. Markedly different, not even close when you have the conservative platform, which is missing all of that, <laughs> like all of that. And you start looking like, where is it? Is it another section? <laughs> Basically their whole indigenous platform was the extractive industry. We're gonna work with First Nation corporations. We're going to empower, skill build, do all of those things that centered around the extractive industry, no recognition of rights or addressing any of the key issues. And on water, only address the most urgent. In fact, his platform didn't vary too far away from the People's Party of Canada platform on Indigenous issues. They were very similar, which, you know, that, that isn't surprising. So uh, the Greens were kind of all over the place, you know, promising lots. We knew they couldn't deliver. They didn't even have the shadow cabinet member for the majority of the year. So uh, good plot, I mean, good platforms. There's lots missing from those platforms, like what's your plan to deal with genocide? What's your, how do you integrate all of these indigenous issues into everything else we're doing? Climate change, jobs, you know, women's issues, international issues. There's, there's a lack of um, putting that all together, but the NDP and Liberals had far, far superior platforms to any of the other parties. And, and Aaron O'Toole tried to talk into the camera and say, this is about respect. But as you say, on the content, he had to explain away the, 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 the failure to recognize the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples and the Harper legacy on the, the murdered and, and missing women and girls inquiry. So for Jagmeet Singh, who, who did push hard on boil water advisories because he kind of had Trudeau in a corner. Trudeau said he'd eliminate it. And Trudeau would say, well, we got it almost there. We're, we're not at the goal line. And Jagmeet Singh 
also tried to make it about trust. Because as you say, the platforms were very similar, but Jagmeet Singh said, he didn't deliver, I can. My question to you is, how did that play among Indigenous voters? It didn't, because here's the thing, as, as much as we'd like to be able to say, you can't compare the federal party with the provincial party, you know, they're all, they're different beings. Um, just look at what the NDP did in Manitoba. I mean, the worst socioeconomic conditions, highest levels of violence and racism and police shootings and incarceration and murder to missing in Manitoba under NDP's watch. What happened in BC? John Horgan, best friend of Indigenous peoples, till he gets in. Then he's all pro-pipeline, sending the RCMP to remove Native people. I mean, Indigenous peoples watch what happens. It's, it's just like, why did Kenny and Pallister and Ford go into hiding during the election? Because everyone knows that's going to influence what people think of O'Toole. Right. And it was the same with Singh, unfortunately. Yeah. Can I just, well, let's just keep you on, on, on the firing line for one last follow up. And that is, you mentioned something earlier that I wanted to circle back to where you said uh, Indigenous issues could have or should have been mm -hmm. a major issue in the election. One of the problems or, or challenges that I find as a journalist and columnist is that to get an issue to get attention, it's got to be seen by the politicians as a vote determining issue. So Canadians now are of a mind to listen up on Indigenous issues. But is it ever going to be a vote determining issue for the electorate so that you can really hold politicians feet to the fire? I think it was this time around. I mean, yeah. if you look at what was in the media headlines for the last two years outside of the pandemic, and it was Indigenous issues, murder to missing, water on reserves, I mean, uh, Mi'kmaq fisheries, all of the violence that, uh, that was happening there, 1492 land back lane, Wet'suwet'en strong, you know, Shekwepmik tiny house wars, like it was just non-stop issues. Uh, and so I wasn't surprised when the surveys around the election said to Canadians, do you care about reconciliation? And the majority of Canadians said that their vote is going to be determined in part by which party is talking about reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And I think that was a missed opportunity by these political leaders. They had an opportunity to connect with voters and say, I hear you. We care about that, too, and make that a priority. Instead, they only talked about it incidentally. Anyone else want to jump in on this issue? Okay. So, uh, Pam, you stole everyone's thunder. No surprise. Okay. <laughs> you silenced us. Um, okay. Just one last um, um, element, and then I want to turn to, to um, the questions we're getting from folks listening in. Um, just to segue to what I said, and I'll, and I'll probably throw this one at, at Tracy and Lori. Uh, two issues that matter to me were childcare and gun control. And they're often seen as women's issues. I like to think of childcare as a parental issue or a societal issue, economic issue, all of the above. Um, it doesn't feel like they were vote determining issues either to me. Um, and, and so and we've seen childcare lose out in, in, a, in a vote in 2006 when the liberals had it and the NDP and Tories weren't interested. And that's an oversimplification, but it didn't come through. And also in Ontario, uh, Kathleen Wynne made childcare a central pillar of her platform. Boom, it got demolished when Doug Ford took power. So what happened with those two issues? And to what extent were they vote determining in Canada or even just in Quebec? Tracy, do you want to try or Laurie? I, I can talk a little bit. Um, is it, or Laurie, do you want to go ahead? No, no, please go ahead. I can follow up. Yeah, so I'll, um, you know, just just on the child care um, point, you know, so I've been, I've been kind of thinking about this, and Martin, I read your column in the Toronto, uh, Toronto Star about this, and I, I, to be honest, like, I, I'm not sure that I fully agree that it wasn't entirely an issue um, to voters and to women voters in particular. I think we'll need to wait to see the answer to that, and there's, there's a sort of a few things I think that, that may make me um, wonder a little bit about um, about that. And the first is that if we look at the, the vote results in the GTA, where we saw that there were um, data coming out that childcare is extremely expensive in lots of different parts of the country, particularly outside of Quebec, but in the GTA, um, you know, Fortress uh, Toronto held for the Liberals. So I, I'm not saying that's necessarily a childcare issue specifically, but it certainly didn't hurt them uh, in that sense. And then the other dimension of this to think about is um, what in political science we refer to as the gender gap in, in voting. And we know that what we have seen sort of in more recent times is that women tend to vote more 
for um, the, the Liberal Party than they do for Conservatives and men vote Conservative versus for the Liberals. And my guess is, and it's again too early to sort of uh, know the answer to this, is that we're going to see that gender gap still remain and be in place in the 2021 election. Um, and so I think it's possible that in the mix, we saw childcare play a part in that and maybe even uh, maybe even gun control. Sorry. Yeah, okay, so a couple of things. I think that the reason that childcare was not explicitly the ballot question was because Trudeau had already moved on this so much before the election was called. He didn't yeah. say, I'm going to election because I want to do childcare now, who's with me? He said, I already signed this with eight provinces. I'd like to do the rest. And so you, he wasn't putting it to voters to say, I need your support to do this because it's massive. So that's one thing. I actually think that both of these issues became a kind of quiet vote question as people started to have the time to flip through Aaron O'Toole's campaign and realize that he actually wasn't progressive at all. And if he was, he would have kept Trudeau's childcare plan. He can't be serious that he thought people were going to like people are, were, were going to vote for this. Like, no, like he should have kept it and just said, I'm committed to families and this is where I'm. And if he's going to try to take the party to the center, then do it for real. And the gun control thing just, you know, by the time he like that flip flop was ridiculous. Um, I'm from Nova Scotia and, you know, definitely like that was a key issue, uh, given what we went through last year with a mass shooting. Like it was it was a key issue. And so I think those are the reasons like that. O'Toole's campaign totally ran out of gas because I think that people were actually looking at it, looking to find something because people were ticked off at Trudeau over, over the election call. Laurie, are, are, are my old friends in Nova Scotia going to reinvent red Toryism? I mean, because you had, you had a premier who, who, who outflanked the liberals in your last provincial election, yeah, a pandemic and election, he, by the way. And he ran explicitly on being a red Tory. Now, his, his government's like weeks old, so let's not all get too excited. But um, we have a strong tradition of red Toryism in Atlantic, Atlantic Canada. We have, you know, love them or hate them. We have the, the McKays, the Crosbys, people who think that government is for something good in your life. And so, yeah. you know, is there something to mine there? I would suspect so. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just go to a question uh, from, the, from the floor, as it were, uh, the virtual floor. Uh, this is from Anna Petridis. Um, it's for Lori, but I think, I think um, Tracy and, and Pam and Sanjay might want to jump in as well. At Trudeau's campaign, on, on the kind of campaign trail, Trudeau was surrounded by People's Party of Canada supporters and got gravel thrown at him on the way to his bus. Could this have been a form of Trumpism? And what does this anger of Canadians represent for Canada? So, Laurie, first to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I think that was a part of the campaign that, that we, ha we haven't really seen that type of thing. I mean, not that it doesn't happen, but the way that it unfolded in this campaign ended up being a, a major theme, I think, that people were angry. They were angry at the prime minister over the election call, but they were already also angry about uh, vaccine, you know, me vaccine measures, lockdown measures, and this sense of frustration. And I think that speaks to a much wider issue around the lack of trust in government and a frustration and a sense that things are not going well for you. And so that's beyond any particular party or any particular prime minister, although I get there's kind of a and for some people like that there's a really kind of palpable targeting of this prime minister like he tends to you know there, there's something about that but i think um it speaks to something more broadly and that's why i think the P ppc was able to get anywhere in this is that they were fine they they created a space to harness that energy around just really being angry Lori, um i'm sorry Lori. uh tracy you you you've dived into this issue of political violence in Canada, what was your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's everything that Lori um, has just said, but I also think it's important um, to um, sort of um, recall that it's not just gravel get, that got thrown at the prime minister. That did get a lot of media attention. It was two journalists actually that got hit by that as well. Okay. But we did see, um, you know, a lot of harassment. Uh, we saw more lawn signs be vandalized with anti-Semitic, racist, misogynist content than I think we've seen maybe ever uh, in, in a Canadian election. So I think it's, you know, th this is sort of one of the things that um, I think about particularly from a gender perspective, it's not just women and not just um, uh, people of color who are being targeted, it's definitely all candidates, but it does also have a very specific uh, target, usually towards women um, and usually towards um, candidates of color. 
And you know, for me, it's it's about everything that Lori said, all these sort of undercurrents that are going on that we're seeing across other parts of the world that maybe Sanjay can speak a little bit about. But it is also this sort of gender and race-based um, elements to it that, that I think really reflect and magnify the systemic racism and misogyny within our society that we have yet to deal with and that we have an entire campaign where we don't really talk about and address these issues. And we might talk about this a little bit later, but for me, I think the political parties themselves actually really um, fell flat on dealing with this. We had a number of candidates who were um, accused of and previously had been found to have sexually harassed or sexually assaulted staffers um, or um, you know, other candidates. And the parties just didn't really respond to that until the media called them out. Uh, and then it was even then, you know, having to push them and force them to, to sort of confront this reality. So I think this raises all kinds of issues um, about the role of parties in this and their vetting processes and, and how they need to take these kinds of issues a lot more seriously. Let me let me try to connect a couple of dots here. Uh, let's talk about the debates for a minute, not for too long. I, I've, I've been at symposia where, where we talk about the debates and everything. I thought this debate was a misfire for a lot of reasons, too many interactions, too many, not enough interaction between the candidates, not too many distractions from the journalists. But, um, and then we had the two solitudes in two different languages. And we had this uproar about the question put to the Bloc Québécois leader about uh, the question of racism and discrimination in Quebec. It was the uproar that I found so interesting that, that whether you thought the question was maladroit or not, and I thought it was, but I thought it was that there was a point to the question that could have been asked a little differently just by quoting judicial decisions about the discrimination rather than offering it as an opinion. But the reaction, the overreaction from Quebec was astonishing, but maybe predictable. What was even more interesting was that the three, three I guess, of the major party leaders, uh, maybe four, all uh, lined up behind Quebec and and said that yeah, this was this was uh, this is like taboo. You crossed a line here. So is it is Canada a, a, a safe space for discussing discrimination in Quebec against religious minorities, or do we all? have to walk on eggshells forevermore when it comes to this issue of, 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 of religious and therefore uh, racial and often uh, gender discrimination if you think of women in hijabs or men in turbans or Jews wearing the kippah. Anyone want to tackle that? Sanjay, why don't you try? Yeah, I mean, I, I was reflecting also in your previous question and they're connected. Um, your own colleague at the Toronto Star wrote really important columns early on in those incidents with stone throwing saying, there's a lot of anti-Trudeau invective, but it's laced with racism and misogyny and xenophobia. And I think there is a tendency in Canada, we have a real penchant for complacency, particularly by thinking of like, what's the worst in the US and how we're better. Um, and this idea that it's Trump, you use a formulation, which I understand it's sort of it's Trumpism. And some of it might be certain language or techniques or rhetoric that comes from that. But I think it's quite clear that, you know, we have these issues and they're very serious. We have a tendency to avoid conflict in our public culture. Um, and I think that's really been born out. I mean, I was really struck by a report that I saw um, a few weeks ago, which uh, really surprised me. The number of, in per capita terms, the number of anti-Asian incidents of racism, discrimination, harassment are higher in Canada during the pandemic than in the United States. That would, now if that's true, that would really shock a lot of Canadian self-image, but that's what's happening. And a lot of friends I know, certainly and colleagues of East Asian descent, you know, this was Trump was saying the China virus. Well, but attacks are happening and harassment was happening in Canada. So, uh, you know, and as, as Pam said at the very beginning, right, we have a history of this that goes back um, in this country as well. So it has, it has its own lineage. And I think it's something we really need to address. On Quebec, I think uh, it's extremely troubling. I think something's also happening in Quebec and we don't want to talk about that question. I mean, there are different models of secularism. I'm going to jump in the snake pit here. You know, there's freedom from religion. That's the, the French model. And that's the one in Quebec, La Cité. There's freedom to the American. There's freedom among religions, which is the Indian model, which is under assault now because you've got a Hindu nationalist prime minister. But you have to ask the question that in 2021, if you're living in a country which is a multinational federation like Canada is, even with its history I don't know, of asymmetry, um, of asymmetric bilingualism and, and recognition for Quebec and so on, you are creating a class of second-class citizens. And it's astonishing that, you know, in Quebec, 
Um, it's astonishing that we're not gonna address this question um, frontly, that, that the politicians won't do it because there's too many seats to be lost. Um, it struck me in 2019 when Jagmeet Singh had a chance to, to address it and he did, and he said, this is a Quebec issue. And I think, I think that's punting and, and you know, if we're looking to our leaders to, to provide leadership and our parties, we have to have a frank public discussion about this without, without sort of getting into, you know, without insulting anyone and without making crass generalizations of an entire province or entire community. We don't wanna do that. But I think that's something we really have to talk about. Um, and I think we have to talk about it more critically and seriously than we do in Canada. It was painful to watch Jagmeet Singh in the last election and also a bit in this election, not wanting to address the issue head on. I don't think it's fair to, to, to force a particular person to, to speak for his entire ethnic group but if, or religious or other group. But if you go into politics for human rights and then, oops, I'm not gonna talk about this because I don't wanna lose seats, that's a little rich. Um, well, Pam, what was your reaction? What were you, what were you watching? It sounds like a, like a TV news question, but um, at the scene of an accident. But when you were watching this byplay uh, in real time in the debate and in the aftermath, what were you thinking? Well, first of all, you don't get to, as a candidate in a federal election, say, you know what? I don't want to talk about racism. I'll only talk about it on a quiet area. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're, you're running to you know win seats. You're part of a party. You don't get to opt out. And the fact that anyone in Quebec would think they get to opt out of the discussion because we don't want to tarnish our reputation because I mean that's this is coming from him you know oh people are just attacking Quebec rightfully so rightfully so attacking racism we've got to go beyond all these political niceties and how the question is asked that's really just a red herring for we don't want to address racism head on and racism is one of those things that are polar opposite you've got uh, the Liberals and NDP who address some level of racism in their platforms. You've got the Conservatives. The word racism doesn't even appear to them in the People's Party of Canada. We're talking about free speech. It's about empowering free speech. So you see in the Liberals and NDP, they're going to bolster criminal code provisions and human rights pro provisions to protect people from hate speech and hate crimes and racism and the exact opposite. They're going to repeal protections on conservatives and people's party of Canada. So it is, it is a very divisive issue. You can only be on one side or the other. You're either pro racist or you're not, but there's one thing in this country, you don't get to not talk about it because this goes beyond political correctness. It kills people. Look at Joyce Echaquan in Quebec. There's a reason why these questions were posed to Quebec and they should have had a really good answer for that. And in fact, they didn't. And instead, they turned it on the questioner. Um, so let me let me segue and jump in. Any anyone else, if you want to. And now we're at, when I just want to go to a question that's related to this from the from the audience. We saw the PPC double its voter percentage. That's Maxime Bernier's party between the last two elections. Is this a pandemic election blip where the party became a lightning rod for the anti-mask movement, or is this a sign of future growth for the party? Anyone want to take that? pick me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I know a lot of people think that this is just COVID pandemic, what? but I actually do a significant amount of research with the Diversity Institute here at Ryerson University on the rise of the far right white supremacies, white nationalist groups, violent groups, incel groups, you name it, and their connections to violence against women and Indigenous peoples, their uh, connection to gun violence and those in the pro gun lobby. And this has been building. What's what's happened? It's always been here, obviously. And the recent research that really takes Canadians aback is that if you look at all the countries in the world, the most active country for online white nationalist pro-violent actions is Canadians. Per capita, Canadians have more activity online, more groups. The danger zone is here. What happens is that the fuel was in the US under Trump and Trump's, you know, basically nod to everybody, including white supremacist groups, violent groups. I mean, look at what happened there. All that's done is shown the people in Canada, uh, you can you can do it. And Maxine Bernier, of course, is there. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm 
anti-immigration, I'm anti-refugees, I'm anti-gun control, I'm anti-human rights, I'm pro-free speech, and I'm even going to get myself arrested at an anti-masker protest in Manitoba. So you've essentially got your Trump outlet here in Canada to let people feel free to come forward. So they've had these views, but they now feel free to come forward and even vote for that kind of party. And I think there's the potential for it to increase. And that's a national security issue that Canada should not overlook. Okay, and, and you, it's impossible to, to minimize the impact of that constant uh, overflow from the US on, on, our, on our airwaves and, and just in our, in our social media discourse. Sanjay, what's your thought on that? The 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 influence of of uh, so-called Trumpism, uh, a real thing. I shouldn't say so-called, and because Trumpism lives on, and and the results we saw in this election, and the way in which Maxime Bernier has played this issue. What's well, very telling? He said that we're not simply a party; we're a movement. Now, yeah. I mean, it's, so the question is, how strong is that movement? How wide? How deep? What are its currents? Um, the Proud Boys, you know, originated in Canada, mm -hmm. something we associate with Trumpism as part of it, but it came here. And I think, again, more widely, it's very striking. Last 15, 20 years, we've seen democracies in Western Europe and North America, the rich democracies of the OECD. We've seen right-wing populism rise. You see this growing social polarization, this growing ethno-nationalism. And all those things are affecting our democracies, and Canada is not immune from it. Um, I think it's striking that there's 5% of Canadians voted for this party. Um, like you said, 2% voted for the Greens. There are lots of reasons people vote for parties and there's strategic reasons, but there are also intrinsic reasons. And the fact that 5% decided to vote for this party, to, you know, when it was very explicit about a lot of its anti-immigrant rhetoric and the vaccine mandates and so on, vaccine's a separate issue, but it gets conflated. I think it's really significant we pay attention to it. And then we think about the fact that a lot of commentary talked about uh, votes that the Conservatives lost to the PPC. But of course, there are going to be some people who voted for the party who also shared some of those attitudes when they didn't vote for the people. So the question is, when we say, I, I, the bottom line can be, well, it's only 5% of, only 5 of Canadians voted for this party. There may be many more who shared their views. Um, and I think that's something that we really have to pay attention to. And I think we talked to national security experts in Canada. I mean, I was mm -hmm. on a panel, the one you'd, men uh, you'd mentioned in the previous exchange was uh, at the IRPP just a week ago, two weeks ago. She said, you know, in the national security business, we never talked to democracy experts about 15 years ago. Now we talk to them all the time because questions of national security and hate crimes and cyber warfare and democratic and the health of our democratic institutions are all bound up together. And she said, I wish this wasn't the case, but she goes, I spend more and more of my time to go to democracy conferences. And that tells you something. Um, so I think there is something there. And it's a, it's a wide phenomenon. It's affecting many democracies. I think that's the, the risk we have is we think we're somehow immune from it. And I don't think we are. Because the threshold keeps getting lower. I mean, people can be influenced, uh, infected by, by extremist rhetoric, but, but the, the triggers are, 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 are lower than they once were. I mean, I, I always will quote the surveys in the US that over the years, if you ask people if they believed Elvis Presley was still alive, you'd get good numbers, like anywhere from seven to 14%, depending on the year. So you're always gonna get people who believe vaccines have microchips or Elvis is alive, and maybe he is. But the, the, but the question is, is going from thinking that stuff to actualizing it because Trump has legitimized that, that course of thought. Let me just try to turn that around and see if anyone will bite. Again, playing devil's advocate here. So we have our election result where actually nothing changed. The opposition is still in the opposition. The Tories are still in their box. Uh, the, the PPC did not win any seats. Uh, the progressive vote, if I can call it that, NDP, Liberal, maybe the Greens, maybe not, uh, is predominant in terms of popular vote and probably seat counts. The BQ can be progressive sometimes too. So not always. So uh, is Canada uh, at, at a precipice or is everything... Or, or is there? Do we need to take a take a deep breath and say, yeah, but this parliament is reflective of our country, and yeah, there's trouble brewing, but we're actually looking pretty good. Anyone want to beat me back on that one? Let me jump quickly. I think in international surveys, Canada ranks very highly, and for good reasons. You look at the Economist Intelligence Unit, you look at uh, VDEM, you look at Freedom House. We rank top five, top ten, and that's nothing. That's nothing to sneeze at, and it does tell you something. 
But I think uh, one of the striking things that I've seen, I mean, having come back to Canada after 25 years away, you know, people have been talking about how our electorate, our society is sort of fragmenting, fracturing in lots of ways, becoming more atomized, becoming more polarized. And you see that in this, in this parliament. Again, five of the last seven elections have left to a hung parliament, minority governments. Uh, Canadians seem to have a, an allergy to this, uh, you know, that it's a bad thing, which is very, it's paradoxical almost, because we sort of, um, we proclaim our sort of values of negotiation and compromise and diversity, but we have this winner takes all system. And I think that mismatch, that tension is really playing itself out in these elections. You know, I think what's striking about the parties is that, as you said, they're not broad tent, they're becoming more, I mean, the Liberals, of course, are broad tent party in some ways, but if you look at some of the breakdowns on constituency voting, it's really striking. You know, who low income voters, those who belong to those occupations, um, essential workers vote disproportionately for the NDP. The NDP is penalized by our electoral system because it's first past the post. So are their voices getting heard? Um, other parties are disproportionately overrepresented, like the bloc, again, because of our electoral system. So I think, I think you see frustration and tension building. And the question is, I think we're relatively stable compared to many other countries. But again, I don't think that means that we can just ignore this. Um, I think there's real, you know, real desire for, for more outlets of voice. Um, so let me jump in there and, and ask a question on behalf of Justine de Leon. Uh, and, and the specific question is, do you think electoral reform is more likely now thanks to this election? And if so, what kind of electoral reform is more, like, is more likely or most likely? Sanjay, why don't you pick up where you left off? Because we're putting you on the spot now. Yeah, we can see the problematic results. Two questions burned in here by Jesse. He, cheats like, he or she cheats like I do. A, is it now going to be more likely because of this result? And if so, what kind? Well, I've been speaking quite a bit, so I'm going to defer to the other panelists. I would say what was striking to me was that I couldn't believe it. It was at the second last day of the campaign. Uh, Justin Trudeau said, and if you vote me back in, electoral reform is back on the back on the cards, which, you know, is a very desperate sort of saying. It doesn't seem like that party is interested in it. Um, it doesn't seem like either of the leading two parties are interested in it. But I think we have to talk about it. I, I'm really interested to hear what Laurie, Pamela, and Tracy think about that. Yeah, and just in, in Trudeau's defense, although that's not my job, he wasn't. He didn't say quite that. He was asked, "What do you think about it?" And he kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, "Well, I like I like the ranked ballot, and uh, if people want to raise that, they're free to raise it. But that we can go in go in circles in that." Anyone else? Yeah, Laurie, I'll just, go ahead. I'll just go quickly, like. Trudeau said in 26, 2017, um, 2016, okay, whatever, when he decided he wasn't doing it anymore, uh, he said there's no consensus on it. Well, I mean, A, I think the government would have had to work to build that consensus if they really wanted to change the electoral system and they wanted the public support to do it. But like Trudeau says he wants to rank ballot if we're gonna switch at all. But the people who are really dug in on electoral reform, almost all of them want proportional representation. So changing to a ranked ballot is not gonna make any anybody necessarily any happier than they are now. I think whether it becomes a question again um, is really up to Mr. Singh. If he wants to start to wave around a piece of paper where he says, I need these things in order to, to support you, that, you know, that might push the conversation. However, um, none of them is really in a position to trigger an early election. And so in some ways that could um, empower Singh to put some things on the, on the table and say, you know, I need, I need these things or else I can't support you. But on the other hand, it could also take away some of that power because he's not going to back, you know, he's not going to back the government into an election. So I think we'd probably see more cooperation on things like um, rent subsidies, student loan relief, as opposed to something that was really transformative, like electoral reform. I'll have a go at this as well. Um, I... I, you know, I'll just say that I do support electoral reform, but I, I don't see that this is going to be likely. Um, you know, Trudeau has made this promise before, and it, you know, it, it, it didn't, uh, it didn't transpire. And, and the one thing I, I guess sort of I would say about this that it, it does kind of concern me a little bit when people who um, sort of uh, really advocate for social justice and want to see effective, meaningful change within our political institutions that we sometimes tend to park that, um, uh, that sentiment within the basket of electoral reform. I, and I think to the exclusion of other debates and conversations that we could be having. 
um, that, that might actually make um, things a little bit uh, a little bit more equitable. So, for example, you know, things about um, having political parties and the role of political parties and making sure that they are nominating, uh, you know, of a diverse, inclusive slate of candidates in ridings where they actually have a chance of winning. Um, you know, ensuring that that um, that partisanship, which is so strong in party discipline, which is extremely strong in Canada's parliament, uh, you know, I, I think is is a barrier to allowing for broader policy discussions that could be going on in these issues. So again, I, I support electoral reform, but I just worry sometimes that we tend to sort of put all our eggs in the basket of electoral reform and then sort of waste our time a little bit debating about that. And I, I guess maybe I'm sort of a bit scarred with the 2007 Ontario referendum yeah. that we had where we invested a lot of energy and a lot of time in, into this. And then, you know, it was at the end sort of all burnout. Yeah, that's the challenge. And I, I, we have a couple of questions, not a ton of questions on electoral reform and they always, they always come. And so I've asked it, but the, the reality is it has been a dead end in Ontario to some extent in BC uh, and other, other jurisdictions, the UK as well. So, it, so it's, it's a hard one to get voters behind. Uh, let me let me switch gears, uh, unless anyone else wants to jump in on that, and just go back to another question. Canada and the U.S. have now had uh, a pandemic election. How did Canada handle the election in mid-pandemic compared to the U.S., who had theirs last year? Similarities and differences between Canada and the U.S. in this. Anything Canada could have done that U.S. countries or others have done better or differently in a pandemic election? Sanjay, why don't you start us on that? Well, one of the biggest differences, of course, is the U.S. had their election before vaccination rolled out. Um, yeah. And that's a huge difference. Um, so we were in a much safer place to have that election. And we have had a much safer election. And I think not to take anything away from the fact that we carried out a safe election, but it's a different context. You know, the one that really stuck out for me internationally was South Korea had a raging pandemic in March 2020. And then they had an election in April which you had record turnout, uh, electoral participation increased, um, and they got it completely under control. Um, it was one of, the, one of those countries amongst the third that I mentioned earlier that saw electoral participation actually rise. And, and so hats off to South Korea, and they handled the pandemic up until the vaccination phase, you know, as well as any country in the world, including Taiwan. And so it's really quite striking. We probably have a lot to learn in those types of lessons. Again, sort of looking abroad to see what we could learn. Um, I think the US, you know, it, it comes down to also leaders. It's about, are they reckless or not? Um, are, they, are they thinking of short-term gain versus long-term public safety when, they're, when, the, when, when it comes to crowd control and comes to social distancing and so on? Um, and I think in that sense, we've been more responsible. That's why what's happened in Alberta is, uh, you know, is so, so tragic and, and it's really worrying given that it was something that didn't have to fall out the way it did. I'll just say one other thing and sneak back in. I think Tracy mentioned about electoral reform and wider questions of institutional reform, I think that's something that we really do have to think about. Um, you know, there are many ways in which we can reform the de democratic system here. I'm very struck, for instance, about candidate selection. Samara put out a, a report recently and they're doing an updated version. It's really striking. Something like 17%, they say, of nominations for parties from 2004 to 2019, only 17% of that figure is right, were contested. And even the campaigns are really short. So we don't, you know, there's lots of ways in which you get greater civic engagement, political representation in our system. And it's not all in electoral reform. It could be in lots of different spaces within our institutional framework. Um, so I think I just wanted to highlight that because she brought up, I think it's really important. Laurie, you look like you wanted to jump in. I'll just be quick. Um, one, one thing that I thought was interesting, like, and, and this is a kind of operations point, is that we have, Elections Canada, whether you, you want to criticize their rollout of this or, or not, like we, we have that one central office that runs the thing across the country. In the US, it's run at the state level. So because the, the rules were kind of augmented this time because of the pandemic in particular, what ended up happening in the lead up to the election and the months before the election is that you saw different states explaining different rules around voting. And yeah. in some states, your mail-in ballot will be taken if it gets there at the right time. In others, it will, it's about when it's postmarked. And, it, and so those sorts of differences can create a lack of trust in the system because you don't, anytime you hear a, a you know, disconnect in the messaging, it's like, okay, well, which is it? And then um, I think, you know, like you, it, unfortunately, and this is, this is a whole other issue, 
the issue of election administration in the US is now a major one because um, Trump and others are you know, insinuating that the result was not legitimate and not the right one. And that's a whole, you know, that's a whole other thing. But I think the fact that there are some, you know, the election administration was an issue the, the whole time and have and putting state officials in the position of having to defend how they were running their election was was not a great moment for trust, actually. Yeah, and we can count our lucky stars for all the flaws here that it is done by Elections Canada for better and sometimes for worse, because it probably was not Elections Canada's best moment in this campaign. Um, let's we we're talking about electoral reform, but I'm gonna I'm gonna segue a little bit from that to talk about representation and 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 Sanjay's point about how nominations take place. Um, Tracy, you do a lot of work on gender parity and women in politics. What about women's representation in this parliament? So the good news is, is it went up by two or three seats. The bad news is it's just one percentage point. And, and I think we've gone down from like 58th to 55th, or we've gone from 55 to 58th place in, in the global rankings in terms of, of uh, women in politics. Uh, and it has been, so there's now about 102, I think, and, and it's taken us a hundred years since the first MP was elected to get over a hundred, MPs. So uh, give us a diagnostic here. Uh, with all the things we've been talking about in terms of, although we only touched on nominations, how did we do? Not good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think everything that you said uh, is accurate. Uh, now we're at, we're at 30%, right? And, and one of the ways I, I often think about this is not just who it is it's underrepresented, but who it is it's overrepresented, because that means that all the decisions that are being made in Parliament are 70% made by men, uh, because 70% of the seats are, are being held by men. Um, you know, we did have uh, a little bit more sort of racial diversity. I think there were about 12 Indigenous MPs who were elected. I think uh, by my count, there are maybe three uh, Black women MPs that we have. Uh, the number of out queer MPs uh, doubled, so I think we're up to uh, about eight. But yeah, I mean, 30% is not great. And, and it's exactly the point that you're, uh, that you're making, Martin, is that, you know, Canada touts itself as being this very gender equal country on the international stage. But the reality is, is that when we look at representation within our um, parliament, we are ranked at 58th. And we've actually declined a little bit, as you say, um, you know, uh, since the last election. We look, for example, at the recent election in Iceland. There was a moment there where we thought it was um, majority women. As it turns out, they did the recount and it's not. Uh, even Germany in the last, uh, the very, very recent election that they had is higher than us at 35%. So we have, a, we have a long way to go. And I think there's all kinds of issues here about leadership during the pandemic uh, and, and the value of having diverse, inclusive decision-making tables where women play a really key role. We know that there are gender and race inequities that the pandemic has exposed. And when those decision-making tables are dominated by mainly white men, it means that we're not going to get the policy solutions uh, that we need that are going to be fair and equitable for the entire Canadian society. Pam, do you want to jump in there as well? Yeah, I think these are all really important points. And then people from like Indigenous communities, Black communities, and other racialized communities uh, also have the additional concern that even when people are elected, they're not necessarily from or of the communities for a wide variety of reasons. So it's not like they're being represented uh, for every one of the candidates. And that's a problem. So you have to, you know, there's a, a secondary analysis that comes from the community. Is that person even advancing black issues? Are, are they talking about these issues? Or are they just happen to be a black person in the same white male system doing the same white male things? And we have the same issue on the indigenous community, but we have an, a, another kind of unique phenomenon with all of this um, fraudulent, and opportunistic identification as being Indigenous, oftentimes only during elections. All of a sudden you find out some candidate is now identifying as Indigenous. That happens a lot in the Conservative Party, a lot of self-identified. Um, and, you, and you saw some across all the parties where they were being uh, identified as not actually being Indigenous, as making fraudulent. So trying to use identity in an opportunistic way to participate in the same oppressive system 
is another very complex layer that it, it makes it very, very difficult for us. And of course, for Indigenous peoples, there's the other side of it, us, you know, our sovereign nations being self-determining and wanting to have co-governance and not be governed. Uh, and recognition for our right to be self-determining, which is now recognized in, you know, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So it, there's a different layer here. And the question isn't just, should there be more Indigenous peoples in Canadian government? Some would say yes, many would say no. So that's a different element altogether. And we've seen the complexity of that too, because you've had Indigenous uh, parliamentarians in Ottawa who have said they didn't feel like they belonged or could be productive. On the other hand, in the Ontario legislature, we've seen Saul Mamakwe, who has who has had a tremendous influence. Uh, I don't want to lapse into cliche, but when literally when he speaks, everyone listens and he jokes about it because because it, everyone's afraid to be caught out not listening. So he actually does have a disproportionate influence. And, and uh, so I guess it, I guess it's a mixed bag. Let me ask you um, another question. This one's from from Jill Branson. Um, Will we see more collaboration between parties? And what does the future hold for federal, provincial, and municipal governments working together at different levels more than we've seen before to have more effective governance, particularly in respect to climate change? If we keep going the same way forward, I fear nothing will change, Jill says. So collaboration, after all this talk about dissension, is there a path forward? Can Someone tell me there is. Please, Laurie. Save us. Um, I th I think there's there's kind of an electoral imperative for that to a certain extent because they they really can't jump to an election again in eighteen months, and so they're going to have to find some way to work together, or they're all going to get burned on that. I think for things like, you know, climate change, reconciliation, and and other issues too, these are long term issues, and they will require some multipartisan collaboration to be able to meet targets because it's not gonna be something that you can do within one electoral cycle or even two electoral cycles. And so we, we kind of need it. But at the same time, sometimes I, I worry that, and you know, this might be an overgeneralization, I don't know yet, but I worry sometimes that the parties are carving up um, the electoral landscape in ways that we don't really need to. And they're competing on the basis of brand mm -hmm. as opposed to on, on clear differences in policy. Like if you're looking at the liberal and the NDP platform and you can find more similarities than differences, well, then what are they fighting about? You know, and they don't, they can be separate parties. That's cool. But that, that has to mean, yeah, okay. When, when you're elected though, accept the fact that you don't have a majority, find ways to work together. It's cool if we have a minority parliament, but we tend to treat them as, as temporary scenarios that can be purged as soon as a, a government sees the path to a majority. And so, like, I wonder if we've all kind of be, got to be part of that cultural shift around the attitude toward minority parliaments so that you can actually let, think of it as a minority parliament, not a minority government. I'm going to try to do that myself and see if that might generate a bit more acceptance of the situation. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm glad you raised that. And, and uh, paradoxically, I wonder if, as, as frustrated as Mr. Trudeau was, that he didn't get what he wanted, in a way, he got what he claimed he wanted, which is maybe a stable, an even more stable minority. This was a, a stable minority, but there was always a threat of an election. Now, everyone's afraid. Everyone's going to think twice before they uh, plunge us into an election, whether it's the prime minister or uh, the leaders of the opposition. So uh, anyone else want to follow up? Because you know, people, Canadians say they like minority government, but I, I sometimes think that, that it's like the sausage factory. When you actually see how it's made, it's not that pretty. I mean, there's a lot of salt and a lot of fat and a lot of nitrites. And, and they actually, you know, it isn't all that collaborative. I mean, it gets pretty feisty in committee and so on. But maybe that's the price fault. Maybe they just have to grow thicker skin. So anyone else on, on whether minority government can be more collaborative, more productive, more stable? I think that... Uh, you know, as Laurie was saying, it, it does reflect on our system, right? I mean, it's, it's not, it's uh, political science called a, a majoritarian system, a winner takes all system. And that's the, that's the sentiment and the mentality it breeds. And I think that's what we have to kind of combat. Um, if you look at Britain, uh, if you look at other West European countries, I mean, most of them, of course, outside of Britain have PR, but it's very striking again, over the last 15, 20 years, it's harder and harder for parties to form some single party majority governments. Uh, coalitions are the norm. Uh, and there's just got to be a lot more negotiation and back and forth. So I think the test in Canada is that when you have a, 
a winner takes all um, system, um, how do you have that change in attitude, uh, both in the parties and, and leaders and also among citizens? I mean, you're saying that we want, we like minority governments, but somehow in some, in some of our public debates, sometimes you'll say, well, how can these parties actually get along? And that's where you have to separate the wheat and the chaff. Like, is it partisan differences or are there genuine, you know, uh, policy-based or ideological differences? I think minority governments, certainly, we have a system that most political scientists say is over-centralized, has too much power in the prime minister's office, has too much power in the executive, party leaders have too much power. Um, and so if a minority government means parliamentary committees um, are in the hands of opposition parties, that there is more scrutiny of legislation, um, that the government of the day doesn't get to pick judges and senators, wh whoever they want, well, that's a good thing, you know? And, and I think that's something that we have to make a case for uh, kind of just more, more openly. And I think there's a, just one last thought. We're, we're living in a world right now where there are lots of strongman autocratic leaders that have come about. Uh, I mean, I worked for the last 30 years in India. Um, they had 25 years of coalition governments, minority governments, the largest, most diverse, uh, most unwieldy in the world. Their governance was much better under those coalition governments than the single party majoritarian leader. And that's the lesson I think we take away from it. Look at all the strongman autocratic leaders from Trump to Bolsonaro in Brazil, to Erdogan, to Modi. Um, look at what's happening in Europe, right? I mean, you, you can see what, if you look at even what's happening in Britain, uh, is, is, is Boris Johnson majority parliamentary government a better governed Britain uh, than, than when they had a minority? Um, most people would say it isn't because there, aren't, there isn't that sort of push and pull uh, that you need in a democracy to keep it to keep it vibrant and to keep it honest. The other just thing is around quickly. indigenous Oops. people's like the indigenous perspective is also minority governments, minority parliaments are act as a check on power. It actually keeps majorities from running roughshod over our rights from imposing solutions that they think are great and we know each one makes things worse. It basically gives us a little bit of breathing room, a little bit of space where they not only have to work with parties in opposition, uh, but as you know, parties in opposition always end up being our best friends. Um, so there's a we have a little bit more power when there's a minority situation, whereas when there isn't, it just it does incalculable damage that is rarely undone. For example, when Trudeau got elected the first time around with his majority, why he had such historic Indigenous support is because one of the things he promised was, I'm going to repeal all of the legislation that the Harper government imposed on First Nations, uh, and we won't have a top-down approach. Not a single one of those laws has been repealed. And, and so we know once the damage is done, no government's going to really undo it on the indigenous side of things. The only time we get important things done, really substantive, is when they're in minority status and they have like, say, liberals with the NDP pushing at them constantly. And we, and oh, Tracy, you were gonna, you were gonna jump in, yes. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think I want to just kind of underscore um, a few points here very quickly is that we, you know, we do have a history of minority parliaments working in Canada. So it, it's not as though parties, you know, don't know how to do it and can't do it. Um, we have had, you know, some really important um, public policies come out of minority uh, parliaments at the uh, federal and the provincial level. But I think the thing too, that I sort of think about with this election in particular is that all of the issues that came up in this campaign didn't end on September 20th. We need our leaders to work together. They have to work together. We are in the middle still of a major global health crisis, a major economic crisis, a crisis around Indigenous reconciliation. There is no option, I don't think, but for our leaders to try to figure out a path forward. And so I think, you know, there are, you know, as we sort of talked about a little bit, but, you know, things about reducing the partisanship uh, and, and the sort of the games that go on uh, between the opposition and, and the government, uh, need, they need to really, you know, consider that and try to figure out a way to make this minority parliament work. Okay. Um, interesting. Uh, clearly, Canadians have spoken on minority government and you have spoken on minority government. And I think if 
if Justin Trudeau had listened to you, if he'd held this before the vote, he might have taken your counsel and saved himself the agony of, of going through a process that delivered the result that Canadians apparently wanted all along. That's all the time we have uh, for tonight. I want to thank our panelists, the, the four doctors, for your wisdom and your dedication to democracy. Tracy Rainey, Sanjay Ruparelia, Lori Turnbull, uh, Pam Palmiter. Pam has to run because she has a class to teach right now. She has got a juggling act uh, mastered here. Um, thank you also to everyone in the audience who, who listened in and who asked questions. Before you go, I just want to tip you off to our next democracy forum next month. Our, our guest will be the Attorney General of Ontario, Doug Downey, and, and I'll be co-hosting with Donna Young, the Dean of the Lincoln Alexander School of Law, Judging Justice in Ontario. You can check it out online and please register to get the Zoom link. And finally, a special thanks to the Faculty of Arts for hosting today's event, the Dean, Dr. Pam Sugiman, and the Head of Strategic Operations, Melissa Wong. Our, grat our gratitude to the Toronto Star for being our media partner for the Democracy Forum. We appreciate the support of Canada's biggest and best newspaper. One last thing, uh, we began with a land acknowledgement. Let's, uh, let's end by reminding everyone that on Thursday, September 30th, we'll be marking the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation to honor the lost children and survivors of residential schools and their families. That's the day after tomorrow. Thanks everyone, merci, megwetch. Stay sane, stay safe, and we'll see you next month, I hope. Bye for now.